Uh, went to UCF here, got a Master of Social Science Education up at FSU right now, Instructional Systems uh, uh, Masters, I think, Masters of Science. I I'm there, I'm just doing work. Um, but this, this is something really interesting. This comes from a semester of uh, teaching at a school in uh, South St. Pete. Uh, I'll tell you the story. It all begins with Wolverine. Um, I had a student, and he was your typical Dennis the Menace kid. He would sit in the back of the class, rock his chair back until it fell over five or six times in a week. And I really had a hard time connecting with the student. And then one day, he's sitting there, we're watching a video, and we're doing something, and he's got this book out. And I'm like, where'd you get that from? It was on the school library. And I'm like, wow, this is great. He likes Wolverine. I grew up looking at, looking at Wolverine comic books. This is, this is awesome. We can connect with this. So I started to think a little bit further. Um, you know, I was a uh, first-year classroom teacher. I, I didn't really know much about comic books. Well, I knew much about it. I knew a little bit about comic books. Um, but I didn't know a whole lot about how to integrate them into the classroom. So I went online like anybody else would do, and I found tons of resources out there that had lesson plans associated with comic books and some comic books you can use and you know, some other purposes and whatnot. But I didn't really see anything that gave you a step-by-step -step guide to go out and find comic books and use them in your classroom. And I thought this was kind of strange because we're providing all of these uh, resources for teachers to use, but we're not actually giving teachers a method of new teachers to learn the process to then implement, uh, implement it on their own and then go from that. So where are we letting them grow? Um, so, except, uh, although the use of comics in the classroom isn't anything new, and it, it is, it, it's been documented uh, for, for quite some time, uh, there needs to be a simplified method created to approach the use of comics in the social studies classroom to accommodate learning and literacy needs of students. Uh, literacy is huge in the social studies classroom. And uh, anyway, we can take the two, put them together, and get something nice out of it. It's a win-win for everyone. Uh, most who suggest comics in, the uh, comics in the classroom suggest comics and provide lesson plans, and that was a big thing. Teachers using other teachers' lesson plans, I, 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 it's been frowned upon. I've seen it being frowned upon. Um, and it's just another skill that teachers need to have to come up and create their own lesson plans. Uh, social studies classroom is a great arena for this model. Uh, as the umbrella of social studies allows for a wider range of available materials, uh, except as a model which does the following, provides a backdrop for the usability of a comic book as a teaching aid, provides a framework towards selecting comics to use in the classroom, offers guidance, and presents a logical and easily learnable model for all educators, veteran or novice. I'm supposed to say novice. Yeah, type of. Uh, so what is except? Well, it's an acronym. Uh, alignment to content standards, content of the book, characters in the book, events associated with the book's release, publishing format, and topical integration. And they all kind of flow together. So while I'm talking about this, I'm going to pass around a couple of things. Um, one's a graphic novel, two are comic books. Uh, the tabs are in there if you want to look at some of the stuff that I pointed out, but I'll, I'll get to that when I get to publish it. Align with the content standards. Always consult the standards. It's big. If you're ever going to introduce something into the classroom, um, you have to con you know, consult the standards. Otherwise, your AP is going to come down or your principal is going to say something. You don't want that, so do what you have to do. Consult the standards. Uh, and they provide leverage. If you uh, approach an AP with a standard and a new method of delivering that to the students, they might be open to it, but you've got to have the concrete evidence. And going beyond the scope of the standard, this is a big one. You can take that and use it as the foundation and obviously build upon that. Nothing new. Uh, this is a standard I pulled out for something I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, content. Now, there are two approaches to content. I've kind of figured this out. Uh, there's the literal world, and then there's creative. Um, you know, sure, I can give you a Captain America comic book where he's fighting Nazis, and we can say, oh, we could tie this into World War II. Or I can give you something more modern, like The Walking Dead, and we can tie this into government principles. So it's really whatever approach you want to take. Uh, but literal, direct example of content, mimicking SSE content, creative, obviously that. Literal is good for lower order thinking and activities, um, remedial work, uh, bell work even, if you want to do that, you could do it. Uh, creative is good for catering to higher order thinking activities or higher order thinking skills, uh, classroom discussions. Uh, literal works well with well-known comic book characters. That's a biggie, we'll get to that in a second. And creative better with less than well-known comic book characters because there are a lot of characters out there that when kids learn about them for the first time, they can kind of then associate the lesson that you're trying to teach with them, which is kind of cool. So obviously, like I said, Captain America fighting the Nazis, um, pretty literal there. You know, you can't, I mean, you can do more with it if you want to, but there's a pretty good literal uh, message in that. Um, Walking Dead, like I said, this is another example where you can take, you know, a creative approach towards teaching government. Uh, this is something really neat. I actually found a bunch of political comics. One of them's coming around right there. I think it's got Jon Stewart on it. Uh, the company's Blue Water, and they produce a couple different series on uh, political figures and uh, like actors and whatnot. Uh, but their political comics are kind of interesting. This one's Nixon. they got a couple other ones out there. There's a Jimmy Carter one, I know. But it's kind of funny, too. Nixon's had a ton of comic books. As far as presidents go, he's, he's publicized, and I think I've counted four or five different, you know, storylines, which is kind of funny. It's, I don't think you would ever you know, know now. Uh, content continued. Uh, age period, and this is big. There, there's a couple of ages of comic books. There's the Platinum Age, which is before Superman. 
Um, so this is stuff that predates uh, 56, I think. Superman comes out, or not 56, 38. Uh, starts with Superman 1938 is the golden age, and these are comics that kind of fall into the, the World War II time frame. There's a lot of good information in those. Silver Age is 1958, uh, 56 to the 70s. And these get you know your big characters, your Spider-Man, your Iron Man, Thor, uh, Hulk, and you know the list goes on and on. But they're relatable characters. Bronze Age is 70 to the late 80s, and modern is mid to late 80s to the present. Uh, older comics tend to be more hero or hero centric. You're going to get a lot of good good versus evil stories out of them. Um, the language is also a little bit more suitable for the classroom. You got to keep that in mind too. And they, like I said, focus on topics of good versus evil. Newer comics tend to be more human centric. Uh, you know, the story of the human being in society. You know, the trials and tribulations of, of living in, in today's society versus you know the 1960s. Um, newer comics have a wide range of language used. But that's a big one. You got to always you know screen them for that. And uh, new comics run the gauntlet of social and cultural issues. <coughs> it's like Iron Man, right? Everybody knows who Iron Man is. We've seen the movies that have come out in the last couple of years. Um, you take a, you know, a tour of Iron Man over the ages. He starts out you know, fighting the angel. It's like a guest appearance. And then you know, Iron Man gets a little angry with himself. He doesn't want the responsibility of being a superhero. And then the Bronze Age shows up. And you now Iron Man deals with alcoholism. And then, you know, modern age, now he's just really dealing with alcoholism. So when you pick a character, you've got to kind of pick the period he's associated with. Um, he, you know, some of the same messages that would go for, you know, Iron Man back in the 60s probably won't hold true for Tony Stark passed out on the floor. So characters in the book, this is a big deal too. Character selection is an important factor for scaffolding. If they know who the character is, you know, you can probably get the lesson across easier to the student than if they don't. Uh, good or bad is always a good indicator. We'll talk about Batman and Joker in a few. Popular, unpopular, another good thing. If the students, like I said, if they don't know who the character is, you can really build a lesson around that character so they kind of develop the character in their mind as opposed to the character on the pages, which is beneficial to the lesson if you're planning on teaching. Um, and within the scope of reason or outside the scope, you know, if the character's really crazy or not so crazy, if they're kind of in the middle, you know, you got to pick one side or the other. You can't pick a middle of the road character. And how relatable can they be to your students? Teenage characters are often really good for high school age students and middle school students. You know, they can identify with them. So this was one of the things I talked. This is, you know, Perry White. Uh, he's the, the air, uh, editor for the Daily Planet. Nobody's ever heard of this guy, but you know, we've all heard of Superman, right? And then when you go to Spider-Man, you got J. Jonah Jameson. We've all seen the Spider-Man movie. You know, we know it's the guy that always is after, you know, Spider-Man to get him. So if you ever want to talk about media, how media tries to attack people, you know, you could probably pick between the two, and you would probably go with somebody who's a little bit more known or has a better probability of being. Um, events associated with the book. Now events, it can be a real life event or it can be a plot arc in the comic book. Um, was there any media attention with the release of this book? The book that I'm passing around, it's, uh, it's the Barack Obama edition of Spider-Man. This was, this was publicized. They reprinted it like two or three times. Um, so that, that's a, I'll get to that in a second. But book release to co coincide with an event, that's a perfect example of that. Uh, is this book part of a greater plot arc? Uh, Marvel did Civil War a couple of years back, and it was, it was kind of like a social commentary on uh, the Patriot Act and how that was influencing America. And it's, it's really interesting. It's something worth checking out. Um, but plot arcs are good for deep analysis, and they, they really are. They really keep the discussion going because there's so many comic books associated with plot arcs. So you can see it from different angles, different characters, and get all those viewpoints necessary to create a really good discussion. Uh, here, here we go. If you hasn't gotten there, this is the Barack Obama edition of Spider-Man, which is at the end he's sitting on top of the uh, the Washington Monument, and you know, worry about Joe Biden fighting, which is kind of funny. Um, this is part of the war genre. This is actually a comic that was released during the Korean War that deals with the Korean War and has a really good literal tie into that. 9/11. Um, it's it's a publicized thing in comic books. Um, this was a collaboration done by a bunch of publishers, um, where artists and you know writers came together and discussed their feelings of 9/11 through comic books. And it's it's really neat to get the the viewpoints of people that create these 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 heroes that we all kind of look up to, and then you know have heroes deal with 9/11. It's kind of neat just to get their their viewpoints. You know, it's it's a really good. It's two volumes. It's really good. This one was kind of funny. This is uh, Ronald Reagan's Raiders uh, dealing with the 1980s. And I, I had to throw this in there. It was just, you know, when you think of the 80s, everybody's going back to, you know, you know, the Reagan 80s and everything of that nature. And it's kind of something to bring in to tie in. Why would everybody want to go back to that? Well, you have Ronald Reagan and his buddies running around with guns. Um, another event. Um, whenever a comic book character dies, it's often on CNN. They always do it. I don't know why. Um, but Spider-Man died last year. And... Uh, 
you know, it was interesting that he died because it, was, it, was a, it wasn't Spider-Man as much as it was a, a different Spider-Man in another universe. Uh, but it was a teenage boy, and it was, it was huge. Um, and it, it was, you know, it was the first time Spider-Man's ever really died, uh, but it was a teenage Spider-Man. So it kind of it, it rang some alarm. New Spider-Man comes out the next month and gets another article. You know, he's of a different race. So it, it's kind of interesting to compare, you know, one thing happening and another thing happening, and then taking both of the media articles around them and creating discussion around them. So it's important to have an event, in most cases, associated with the comic book. Publishing format, and this is the huge thing. Um, how is it published? I've got a graphic novel going around. I've got a, well, it's, it's a graphic novel, but it's a collection of comic books and two separate comic books. There are digital comic books out there that you can get for tablets um, you know, and subscription services that are out there as well. But you've got to find a common medium that works well for you for as far as finances go, as far as what your students are going to do, um, and as far as the comic goes, too. This is interesting. This, I actually went to go look for a version of this today at a comic book store over in, uh, off of Colonial. And they get one in every once in a while. This is uh, Amazing Spider-Man number 36. In this issue, this, it deals with 9-11, like I said. Uh, but Spider-Man watches the towers fall. And, and he's helpless. You know, he, he, and it's, it kind of relates to that helplessness that we all felt. But it's, it's one of these comic books. If you find it, it's going to cost you $20 or more. So you really got to look for a different way to get it. So like a digital subscription would probably be best for this. Um, and here we go, Marvel. This is just an example of Marvel's subscription service. It's, you know, it's $60 a year, but you have unlimited access to all the Marvel comics, which is kind of cool. Um, topic integration, and how well does this fit into your class? You know, if it's going to go right in there, awesome. If you really got to stretch it to get it in there, um, it's probably not, you know, something you want to use. And, you know, the seamless nature of integrating a comic into the classroom, it should be fluid. It shouldn't be forced. So. Let's take a look at this one. The book's coming around. This is uh, Death in the Family. And this is an interesting set of comics. It's an interesting plot arc. It was one of the first times, kind of like American Idol, where you can text in uh, who you want to win, right? Well, back when this was happening, uh, comic book voters got to call in and decide if Robin was going to live or if Robin was going to die. And they voted for Robin to die. Well, that's just weird. Um, but it's kind of neat to integrate that in. But Death in the Family, how it works with the accept model. Oh, uh, lines with standards. I've got SS912 C42. Uh, evaluate, uh, evaluate the influence of American foreign policy on other nations. Uh, analyze the effects of foreign and domestic terrorism on the American people. Describe the impact of global response to international terrorism. Uh, content. Comic is based in the modern age of comics. Remember, it's after, it's that late 80s to present period. Uh, it has literal interpretations in it, and it can be used for some creative ones if you wanted to. Uh, content focuses on Batman, the Joker, terrorism, and diplomatic immunity, which, you know, you don't really see a whole lot of resources out there that tie into diplomatic immunity. Uh, and it's relatable to government history standards. The characters associated with it, obviously, most students know who Batman and Robin are, and they know who Batman and Joker are. I teach chaos versus order in American government with Batman versus Joker. Um, but characters align with good and evil, and this is big. Obviously, you can take the evil character Joker, throw the bad things with him, and they can, you know, transpose what's going to happen. Uh, students can then relate to these characters because of their brand power, and that's, that's a good term there, the brand power one. Uh, but they're easily identifiable in explanations. You don't need everybody in the class to know comic books to know, obviously, Batman and Joker. Uh, events associated with the book's release, like I said, the calling thing, that was a big thing for comic books. It, it was published in some newspapers at the time. Death of a major comic book character, I brought that up too. Um, the eye told Khomeini, he's in this comic book, all right? And this is, you know, towards the end of the 80s, and there's still, there's still a lot of resentment then for the Iran uh, hostage crisis. So it's kind of neat that that's in there too. So publishing format, um, it's in a graphic novel. You can get the regular versions of it too. You can get digital formats of it as well. So it is out there. Um, it's just really what you want to do. And of course, topical integration. Um, how do I do topical integration? It's kind of neat. It's, 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 it's a ranking system. But you know, a comic book, when I look at it, I try to go over all my criteria and I try to give it a point value. Uh, nine to 10 points, it's an excellent resource. Seven to 10, good. Uh, five to six, poor. One to four, you should probably try to find something else. There's something better out there for you. Um, for Batman Death in the Family, alignment with standards, yes. Content easy to teach with, yes. Characters relatable, absolutely. Uh, event tied to release, you got it. Published format readily available, yes. And topic integration relatively seamless, yes. So uh, this one will kind of fall between a 9 and a 10. It covers all the bases. You know, I could probably approach a principal with this. I'd say, look, Batman in the classroom, let's do this. Um, but let's talk about it. The book's coming around. I, I earmark some of the things. Uh, here's one Joker, you know, takes over an airplane, he hijacks an airplane. Okay, we can obviously make a literal, you know, relation to that. Um, Joker meeting with the Ayatollah Khomeini. He wants to become part of the ambassadorship to the United States, to the UN. Um, you know, Batman is dealing now with the death of Robin, and he's obviously angry at Joker. 
um, and he wants to do something about it. Well, lo and behold, um, Joker is now the UN ambassador to Iran, so we can talk about diplomatic immunity and how when people from other governments come over here, the United States can't touch them. Um, that's, that's been a topic in recent history, too. Further, we go down the list, um, you know, and then Joker, he's getting on the podium and he's ranting and raving for an hour about